and welcome to Belmont Journal, Belmont's new show and community update. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. And first, let's start with community announcements. On November 4th at 7 p.m. at the Community Path Committee, the design consultant is presenting the submitted 25% design of phase one of the Belmont Community Path. Soon link to attend the meeting is posted on the town website. Belmont Culture Council seeks funding proposals for art and cultural programs. The deadline to submit your project has been extended to November 1st. More info on massculturecouncil.org. And today with us, we have Franklin Tucker, the editor of the Belmontonia.com. Hi, Franklin. How are you? Good. Today we have some news from the Burbank School. Can you share, please? Yes, uh, we have the unfortunate news that the uh, principal, uh, Seely Oki, uh, was uh, forced to resign uh, after his staff in the district lost confidence in his uh, management of the uh, school. Um, uh, since the beginning of September, uh, there's been questions and concerns from staff and teachers how uh, Oki was uh, managing. And it all came to a head uh, during um, uh, an unfortunate event with a student who was um, who needed restraining uh, uh, during what it was what is called in the district a, a de-escalation uh, incident, um, and um, that uh, brought um, uh, a number of complaints from teachers and, and staff. And um, he was then placed on administrative leave right after that incident. And it just and after a number of conversations, it became evident that it was time for him to go. And that's unfortunate, you know. There's a thing that you don't want to see principals who are the leaders of these communities. Uh, changing in the middle of the year. Now, Belmont now is looking for two elementary principals as the butler's Danielle uh, Betancourt is um, leaving for London, where I believe her uh, husband is now um, uh, working. So uh, we're, losing, we're losing two or four uh, principals. And I believe the, um, uh, we have our, our principals uh, of, of the other two elementary schools have less than five years um, a tenure, even less than that. So it, it's a um, so we we are in a leadership uh, uh, vacuum, and uh, that will somehow be uh, changed soon. That's right. And talking about schools, we have some news about enrollments. Yeah, enrollments. Uh, you know, uh, for the past decade, uh, uh, we've been having skyrocketing enrollments for all grades in Belmont. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, between uh, 2012 and 2019. Uh, um, we had 639 new students come in, and that's a, that's an entire school. That's a that's a that's as big as an elementary school, and that's one of the reasons why we have a seventh and eighth, a new seventh and eighth grade school at the high school. Um, what happened over the last two years is is that uh, the district has lost about 350 students. Now, how did that happen? Um, basically, COVID. A lot of uh, people took their, uh, a lot of uh, parents took their kids out of the school system, brought, bring them to private school, parochial schools. Um, and also, there was an anecdotal evidence um, uh, that was brought up by uh, the recently departed uh, Andrea Presswich uh, from the school committee. And then she said that, um, you know, uh, there are much fewer overseas students who are, who are coming in. You know, there's a, a large, um, there's a good sized percentage of students who come in uh, 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 with their parents who are taking a position at, at universities or businesses. And um, they do that for anywhere between two and 12 years. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, we, we've seen that really big decrease. Um, and um, uh, well, the good news for that is that for the first time ever, uh, we've had all elementary classrooms meet this uh, school committee's criteria for uh, for um, uh, levels for the correct staffing, so we so uh, for the first time we we actually have classrooms that that meet the standards uh, that that the school committee has placed on um, for for good teaching, and uh, that's something that we weren't uh, prepared for. But that's not to say that the numbers aren't going to be. Uh, increasing sometime soon you know once people get to see the new school and people and, and students and, and parents of students in the middle school see with that they're going to be going to a new school with with great uh, great facilities you might see an uh, increase again so it, 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 you know if it wasn't for covid the numbers probably would have been much higher than it is right now but good news right now correct let's change some some subjects right now and we're going to talk about fire pits 
fire pits. They're so popular all across the country, even in the, around here, people are saying, let's have a fire pit soiree. Uh, you know, the fire pit is something that, you know, you, you it's um, like a little oven that's basically you throw outside and put, it's either gas fired or, or, or lit by uh, wood. And, you know, you, you do s'mores and you do, you, you camp around it and sing songs, I guess. Um, and they're very popular and, and everybody's thinking about getting one. Don't get one in Belmont. They're illegal. Oh, no. <laughs> that's even, right. Oh, no. Even the for fire... s'mores. What? Even for s'mores. Even for s'mores, you can't do it. You can't have a fireplace outside in Belmont. All right. So just tell you, don't don't go to T- Home Depot and get one of those fire pits. They're illegal. I'm here with us, Joanna Jubilees, our multimedia journalist from Belmont Citizen Herald and Wicked Look at Belmont. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Maribel. And today we have some news from my school committee member, this resigning. Please tell us. Yes, Maribel. Um, at the October 19th meeting, there was a last minute agenda item added um, to announce the resignation of Andrea Prestwich. And this came as a big surprise to the committee as well as the entire town. Um, she said she's starting a new position on October 25th with the National Science Foundation. She apologized for the inconvenience that stepping down early will have. She um, is effective October 20th. So as of October 20th, school committee is down a member. So what's going to happen is the uh, school committee and the select board have to meet jointly on October 25th to discuss the appointment process. The last time there was a vacancy was when Susan Burgess Cox resigned in 2020 during the height of the pandemic. And there was an appointment process for her as well. And there were many, many applicants. So it'll be interesting to see how many applicants they get this time. But I think I'll just say a few things about Andrea. She was the chairman of the school committee during the height of the fan- pandemic. She stepped up to the plate when Susan Burgess Cox resigned. She took over as chairman. It was a very difficult time. Everyone acknowledged that at her last meeting on the 19th. Um, uh, Superintendent Phelan said, recognized her for all the work she spent, time she worked, spent, spent working with him behind the scenes during the COVID challenges. And um, Amy Checkaway praised her for all her uh, efforts to reevaluate school start times and to get more funding for the schools. And again, it was it was a very difficult time to be, to be chair. Um, I think it was uh, Andrea that said, uh, they are battle scarred. That's right. That's right. And now we wish her well. And now we have news about the Belmont High School pool. Yes, it's exciting news. The Hickenbottom pool is open again, Maribel. It was closed for two years because if anyone doesn't know this, the field house, which includes the pool, is the only original part of the old high school building that they are keeping. That's what's considered the, you know, that's why it's considered an addition, not just a brand new building. They kept the field house and they completely renovated the pool and just reopened it on October 15th. So the girls swim team got to use it this past week. Mind you, for two years, they've been without a pool and they've had to use other pools, including pools in Sudbury and Wellesley. And they had like practices at all different times of the day, whenever they could fit in. A lot of them were late at night. And it's just, it's just very exciting that they finally have the pool again. And a lot of the public is asking if they'll be able to use it. And the recreation department said they are figuring out the scheduling for that for public, public swim times. They would definitely like to have the public use it, but they have to figure out the times because the Belmont aquatic team is gonna start using it, the dolphins, the boys swim team. So I think, and I also wanna just give a shout out to our girls swim team. They are six and two. So far, they have one more meet on Saturday, the 23rd, and then it'll be on to uh, championships, hopefully, for that. Go swimming team. And now talking about the West of Harris Field, can you share yes. what's going on? I sure can. So the Belmont High School Building Committee met, had a public meeting to discuss the plans for West of Harris Field because they, go, they want to start construction this summer on the new fields there, you know, obviously we're missing fields now. So they have to reconstruct those. They hope to start this summer so that the fields could be ready to use in the spring of 2023. But they have to figure out 
parking. How many parking spaces will there be west of Harris Field? And that will determine the design of that area. They, they know where the rink is going to be. That's been decided. But they also have to plan for the reconstruction of that building. That building will probably get torn down and rebuilt. So they have to kind of plan around that so that if they, if they you know, do all this construction and make it all brand new and beautiful, they don't want to have to rip it up when that construction project for the new rink starts. So there's a lot of planning that's going to be involved in this, a lot of things to consider, a budget that they have to stay on track with. Um, tennis courts will not be included in, in this plan. That's definitely out of the plan. They'll be at the Winbrook and the design, um, they're going to meet again, a very important meeting, November 18th at 7 p.m. to just to look at different design options and make a decision, hopefully. Right, right. Big decisions to make. Thank you, Joanna, for your time. You're welcome. Last Saturday, October 16th, the residents were invited to the police station river cutting ceremony. If you couldn't be there, here are the highlights. We are so proud of what we have accomplished for the police department and for the town. And we did it without a debt exclusion. No new taxes. We are, and <laughs> yay. We are ending in the black. We may only have 58 cents left over, but we're in the black. That's all that matters. I want to thank again Ted Galante because when the building committee started, we didn't know that we would get this far. We thought, well, we would try to put some band-aids on the original structure, hope to get a couple of years out of it, and then go to some plan B. But it was Ted who had the vision for revamping the building in the way that you'll see when you go inside. The, the, the net result is we were able to double the building in size, do it in a way that was cost effective. We believe saving the town $30 million. Reports just this week, our construction costs are going up another 15% just this year. Um, so, um, reusing existing building stock, expanding building stock, and turning it into something that can really last and have endurance is essential for our town. This is a building that will last for at least 60 years and will serve the town well into the future. It'll provide uh, a safe environment for, for guests to our, biz, our building and, the, and a great working environment for offices. I thank you very much for, uh, for coming out to show your support of this project and everybody who supported the project in the past. You're going to come in through the sally port and you can, we've basically unlocked all the doors so you can walk in, you can see our booking area, you can go to the right and see our, our jail cells and then when you leave we'll show you how to get out. We have offices stationed throughout the building. Feel free to walk around the building and check out all the offices and, and different areas that you see in there. And you can go also down into the basement, see our storage and our garage. This parking deck right here is underneath that parking deck is our garage, our three bay garage. So you can see the wonderful job that the architect did fitting everything into this, uh, into this tight spot. Oh, I need two people to hold the ends and one to cut. I'm going to ask Mike Smith to do the cutting and if Roy and Judith could hold the two ends. Okay, there we go. <laughs> what an honor to be able to do that. Leigh Richard Lane, former assistant chief, was in the heart and thoughts of many during the police station river cutting ceremony. Richard Lane's family was there to inaugurate the kitchen as Richard Lane Cafe. Here, why? Today we're here to recognize and honor the memory and, and to dedicate an area within the newly renovated Belmont Police Station to our great friend and colleague, Assistant Chief Richard J. Lane. The area which is now known as the Richard J. Lane Cafe. Just to touch on Richie, the person and police officer. <clears throat> I would describe Richie as a consummate professional, an extremely passionate person, always looking to take care of the less fortunate, and as we say, a cop's cop. A person you knew you could count on to get the job done and always doing the right thing. He truly loved being a police officer and everything it stood for, and he showed it each and every day. Everyone was aware Richie had his official office on the second floor, but I can honestly tell you, especially during my tenure, I would describe the now Richard J. Lang Cafe as Richie's unofficial office. All right, ready, Deb? Yeah. Here's the video. Thank you. 
So the word went out, and boy, did people respond, donating tens of thousands of dollars in amounts big and small from groups and private individuals to make the Richard Lane Cafe a reality. May this Lane Cafe serve as a constant reminder to every brother and sister in blue from this day forward of that standard of excellence that Richie set for the Belmont Police Department. Thank you all for what you have done today to make the Lane family, Lane family feel very special today. We are grateful for that and grateful to have Richie in our lives. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Lisa G. Valerio, Prevention Specialist at Wayside Youth and Family Support Network and Coordinator of Belmont Wellness Coalition, tell us what to do in case you witness or suspect domestic violence. Lisa is interviewed by Mike Crowley. So this week we're talking about domestic violence, and I'll just point out real, real quickly that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Lisa, let me ask you first, how often does domestic violence happen in Belmont? Well, Mike, in order to get an answer to that question, I reached out to our police chief, Chief McIsaac, and he informed me that they do receive a fair number of calls related to domestic violence. So it does indeed occur here in Belmont. All right, so, you know, let me, let me ask you too, Lisa, if, if you suspect, if anyone suspects that a neighbor or a friend or even a child is a victim of violence, uh, what's, what's the recommended approach? Um, so there are a couple of different avenues that one can take if they do suspect that a neighbor or friend is, is a victim of violence. Um, first of all, in a non-crisis moment, it's advised to go ahead and reach out to the person that you are concerned about. Um, check in with them gently. Ask them if you can be of help. Um, find a time that's not chaotic, a, you know, a time that you can actually perhaps listen to their story, listen to what's happening with them. Um, you, you know, validate what you're hearing. And, and what we mean by that is to just, you know, say that you're sorry that blank is happening, that whatever they have told you, um, you know, ask them if they're open to, you know, hearing some support possibilities from you. For example, you can encourage them to contact the Belmont Police Department, the non-emergency line 4841212, and they can get put in touch with a police officer who can then offer um, support to them um, around domestic violence. And if they don't feel comfortable reaching out you know, to our own local police department as a first step, they can certainly contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And I think we have that number available. Um, and that is a place, Mike, where you can speak completely confidentially to someone about what's happening to you, and they will direct you to more resources. So I would say that offering those two pieces of um, advice or, or ways to get support are a good way to start. And if you, if you do not feel comfortable reaching out or you don't know them well enough, um, you can also confidentially contact the Belmont Police Department and say, hey, look, there's a situation on my street. I don't know the people that well. I'm hearing blank or I'm seeing blank. And I'm just wondering if you can check in on this family. And so that is an option as well. So Lisa, it does sound as though reaching out for for assistance, whether that be with the police or the National Domestic Abuse Hotline or, um, um, or, or some other supportive service is fundamental to getting help and, and support? Absolutely, Mike. I was um, heartened to learn from my conversation with Chief McIsaac that I department are well trained in domestic violence. In fact, we have a sergeant on the department who has gone above and beyond and has real specialized training in how to offer support in these cases. So absolutely contacting the national hotline or contacting our own um, police department to get to bring in supports. And of course, if something is happening in the moment, if you're hearing something that sounds dangerous, just call 911. Um, that is a time when you don't call the non-emergency line. You would just call 911. 
So that's so helpful. That's so helpful, Lisa. Um, anything else to add? Um, just that, you know, it, it is a problem everywhere and here in Belmont. And, um, it, you know, Chief McIsaac had said that it's something, again, it's a priority of the police department. And um, they are committed to supporting families in any way that they can. And of course, we know that domestic violence not only impacts, you know, the people who are, you know, dealing with it, but it impacts families for generations. So it is something that we really do want to offer support to, um, you know, so that we can interfere and, and have a positive impact. Um, as you said, this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And as such, um, Wayside has two events this month. So I think we're going to see a little information on that, um, a vigil this week and an event next week. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. This is such an important topic. And if, if, if someone needs help um, calling the police um, or um, another resource, as you pointed out, um, is a good first step. As you know, the Recreation Department has launched a Halloween house decoration contest. You have until Monday, October 25th to participate. One of the participants is Emma Thurston. Joanna Jubilees meets with her in front of her house. Hi, I'm Emma Thurston. I live at 101 Baker Street, the clown house. I think it started maybe Four or five years ago, we got the sandworm and we had a headless horseman inflatable. And my sister and I basically, we share the house together. My sister and I, with our family, have the whole house. And we um, we were very sad about the lack of trick-or-treaters in the neighborhood because we just didn't get any. We're, it's kind of a weird spot for trick-or-treating. So we were trying to figure out ways that we could kind of coax people to come down. So we started there. And then every year we just kind of added. And then last year with the pandemic, we just went all the way. <laughs> so we added the clown, this is Clarence. We added him and then a couple other ones came next. We got a couple more inflatables and then from there it was just all downhill. So once we started, we couldn't stop. A couple of pumpkins we found. There's always spider webs. He was one of the original ones too, that jack o lantern. Uh, the kids actually were more afraid of him, I think, than all clowns, our kids. And we've got a little parrot that talks motion sensor. <laughs> addition. Not motion, he's supposed to be motion activated, but it doesn't work very well. So we added him this and found him uh, also a home depot. We added him. So this was this was a must-have for us. We love Beetlejuice. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of people drive by to check it out. Yeah, like, almost every time I look out the window, I see some like a car here or somebody here taking pictures. So, we were shopping for more decorations yesterday. And the body bag, and we were going to get a couple other things. We decided, like, no, it doesn't fit our theme. Because every decoration is always too, like, happy. But, like, we need something like this. Scary thing. We gotta keep with the, with the yeah. clown town. Yeah. Yeah. Every time somebody comes by and is excited and taking pictures, it makes me feel good. So it's we're all psyched about that. And you know, it brings people some entertainment and life is weird, so entertainment and little joy is a good thing. So. Right. And now our community calendar. For the second year, the women's club is holding a pumpkin giveaway. This Sunday, October 24, from 1 to 3 p.m. Families can drive by the Homer House on Pleasant Street using the driveway to receive a pumpkin and crafts as well, supported by many local farms and vendors. Join Belmont Books for a very special in-person event on Tuesday, October 26, at 6 p.m. in Boston. New York Times best-selling author Gina Blum We'll do a reading signing of her new memoir, Woodrow on the Bench, about her last seven months with her beloved Black Lab Woodrow, and what day he and her Boston community taught her about life and love. Please bring your dogs to this kind of friendly event hosted by Belmont Books, but held at BC Block of the Commonwealth Mall 
rain date November 1st at 6 p.m. No need to register. Belmont Public Library invites you to a virtual night of myths and miracles of Victorian medicine on Wednesday, October 27, from 7 to 8 p.m. Meryl Mills, a fictional lady who has endured every illness known to men, escorts audiences into the simultaneously advanced and utterly primitive world of medicine during the late 1800s. You will learn about Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, hygiene practices, patent remedies, kitchen cupboard concussions that in today's world often defy common sense. The Belmont Library of Art offers a feast for the eyes and food for the soul with this new hybrid exhibit called Nourish. While you can admire the pieces of art in the Homer building, like in the pre-pandemic time, you can also participate to the online reception on Friday, October 29th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. The Zoom link will be available on the BGA website, belmontgallery.org. Learn how to get the most out of your hikes in Mass Audubon. Free online program, Hiking 101 on Friday, November 5th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. You will find out how to interpret the landscape, familiarize yourself with map reading, and learn what to do if you find yourself in challenging situations. To attend, register on massaudubon.org. That says for this week. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. See you next time.